I'm going to present an update of our results and uh, excited to share some of the uh, recent opportunities that we have found around the carbon uptake calculations. And uh, this is a collaborative work between our team at the Concrete Sustainability Hub and uh, Whole Team Innovation Center in, in, in Europe. To start this presentation, I just want to talk a little bit about the carbon neutrality concept uh, that you might be familiar with. Uh, uh, we have this scale as uh, our carbon neutrality scale, and on one side, we have the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the uh, cement and use applications could be concrete or mortar or uh, different types of cement based products, uh, and we need to uh, totally remove this uh, cement uh, uh, emissions uh, throughout the life cycle by different opportunities. One opportunity is to reduce the GHG emissions, and the other part is about neutralization. So whatever we couldn't reduce, we have to remove it from the atmosphere by neutralization activities. For the reduction activities, we are facing multiple opportunities. And uh, to be quite honest, uh, among the stakeholders of the value chain, we see a great momentum around optimizing the mix design, increasing the uh, supplementary cementitious materials content. Uh, but on the other side, when we think about the neutralization of the greenhouse gases from uh, the GHG emissions uh, associated with the life cycle of cement-based products, we see some of the technologies that are still under development. So. Uh, we're still facing a little bit of cost issue or the technology need, needs to be scaled. But we see an opportunity here for carbon sequestration through carbon uptake. And it can be considered as a part of our neutralization acti activity to move towards carbon neutrality. But uh, the, the main concern here is that the extent of carbon uptake uh, for different cement-based products and for different cement and use applications is under debate. So this is a news press that I got from the zine, and you can see the headline that talks about cement and concrete are not carbon sinks, uh, according to an interview with a, with a scientist. And on the other side, we see the IPCC document that in chapter five, they talk about carbon uh, concrete as a major carbon sink. And we see that they talk about uh, offsetting about one half of the carbon emissions from the current cement production. So these uh, uh, contradictory opinions motivate us to go deeper and understand the implication of the carbon uptake in the sequestration and neutralization of the cement based products emissions. But let's talk a little bit about the background of this research. So as you uh, probably know, uh, carbon uptake from experimental and numerical perspective have been investigated for many decades. Um, this is on the left, you can see a screenshot that I got from um, this uh, book that is published by ASTM and is uh, uh, some of the authors from Portland Cement Association studies, the experimental and numerical evaluation of carbon uptake in 1958. Uh, so it's, it's a phenomenon well understood uh, by the materials researchers. And during the past few decades, we see some efforts in different standards to include the carbon uptake in life cycle assessments of concrete. Uh, for example, this is a, a very simple example that I calculated for a 3000 PSI concrete mixture with an exposure condition of indoor without cover and with seven year carbonation age, we see a depth of one inch carbonation estimation. And it's based on the EN standard and using the CS hub uh, carbon uptake calculator tool. So we have the tool here, we have the standards, and we have a great understanding of the carbon uptake phenomena and the mechanisms and the chemical and physical relationship between different parameters here. But uh, we have to think about this carbon uptake from a framework setting when we want to include this in our uh, evaluation, in environmental evaluation. There are two major mechanisms that I would like to discuss and two major frameworks that I would like to share with you. And uh, after that, I'll show you a few examples of this. The, the first one is about carbon uptake inclusion or incorporation in LCA of cement-based products. So if you want to evaluate the life cycle uh, environmental impacts or GHG emissions associated with uh, cement and use applications, including buildings, pavements, uh, pipelines, tunnels, whatever we can imagine, 
we know that there is some emissions associated with the construction. Uh, so we have the greenhouse gas emissions on the left part, as you can see here. Uh, then we have the uh, carbon sequestration during the use as a result of the natural carbon uptake. And at the end of life, when the cement-based products is demolished, there is an opportunity to extend the carbonation or carbon uptake to sequester more CO2 at the end of life. So as you can see, we track the amount of uh, GHG exchanges and CO2 exchanges uh, in time to assess the net life cycle of GHG. And this is where we want to include carbon uptake as a part of our life cycle assessment. On the other part, when we think about the carbon uptake estimations, when we want to analyze the sectoral footprint, we, we are facing a different system. On the x-axis, we have the annual emissions or the amount of uptake, but on the y-axis, we have the net sectoral GHG emissions, meaning that for a given year, for example, this column here, we calculate the amount of emissions associated with the production or consumption of that material, let's say here, Portland cement, and the amount of sequestration that happens in that given year for different end use applications. Here I put some uh, small uh, icons, buildings, pavements, tunnels, railways, and end of life of these materials within that given year. And we can repeat doing the, uh, this calculation for other years to have a better understanding of the sectoral footprint in that specific uh, time horizon or uh, given year. So, as I said, we have the incorporation of LCA for uh, incorporation of carbon uptake for LCA um, applications. Our audience here is architects, uh, LCA practitioners, and procurement decision makers. And we are facing a data requirement. Obviously, we need input data for these calculations. Here, we need the cement based product types, either mortar or concrete, uh, the most common ones for. Uh, cement-based products. We need to have a good understanding of the geometry of those elements. We need to have uh, some understanding of their mechanical performance, the binder types and quantity in the concrete and mortar. So these are the information that we definitely need to in include in our analysis when we want to assess the uh, impact of carbon uptake in the total GHG emissions associated with life cycle of end use applications. On the other side, we are facing a more data intensive process, which is the carbon uptake estimations uh, considering the sectoral footprint. So we need to understand how much cement goes to which sector and which end use applications, you know, how much goes to pavements, buildings, et cetera. Uh, on the left part, I discussed uh, a typical project, for example, a building, but on the right side, we need different types of archetypes. Uh, we need to have a better understanding of the typical construction methods and practices in different locations for a country um, with uh, like US with very uh, wide diversity of the code adoptions and construction methods, we definitely need to consider this. We need to understand the regional concrete binders and packaging uh, methods um, in different locations. And because as, as I showed you in the previous slide, we need, uh, we need to track these in time. We definitely need to have an understanding of the rate of construction and reconstruction. And obviously we can use it for reporting the organizational GHG uh, emission factors or the policy making purposes. For example, when we think about the low carbon concrete policy, what would be the consequence from the, or the co-benefits from the carbon uptake uh, perspective? Focusing on the first part, including carbon uptake in LCA, the lessons that we have learned, I'm gonna summarize it here. So three lessons, uh, first of all, we now have the capability to include it uh, for different cement end use applications and uptake can be accounted for, for different cement end use applications in a computationally efficient manner. Then um, we see the building level results are uh, very sensitive to the input parameters. Uh, some of these input parameters that I can mention here is the cement-based product types, the mix design, and the geometry of those elements. The use and end-of-life uptake uh, can considerably sequester the emissions associated with the calcination emission of Portland cement. Our evaluation for the U.S. commercial and residential buildings is around 15 to 35 percent, respectively. 
And I'll show you how these ranges can vary from one case study to another. So uh, as I said, one of the most complicated version uh, or um, most difficult part for, uh, for assessing the uh, carbon uptake is for buildings, most importantly because of the geometry of different elements. And here our model uh, could capture uh, the surface areas of each element and some of the other properties uh, relevant to compressive strength. The exposure conditions uh, is very important because usually uh, concrete elements in buildings have two exposure conditions. For example, we have slab on the ground on one side, the, the slab is in contact with soil and on the other side, it's uh, either finished or unfinished surface. So the rate of uptake would be quite uh, different. And we have US industry average concrete mix designs uh, from National Ready Mix Concrete Association industry-wide EPD program. And for the mortar uptake, uh, we incorporated a diffusivity model to precisely calculate the uh, concrete masonry unit uptake and the other mortar applications such as rendering and plastering for different types of buildings. Here's the first result that I wanted to show you is a residential single family building with CMU walls. Uh, on the y-axis, you can see the cumulative amount of uptake in terms of ton CO2. And on the x-axis, you can see the building age. Uh, from our understanding uh, and the data that we could collect from US Census Bureau, the average age of buildings in the US is around 60 years. So we track the amount of uptake up to 60 years uh, for this building level analysis. And here you can see uh, that the lowest carbon uptake rate belongs to columns, most importantly because of the compressive strength and the exposure condition. As opposed to concrete masonry units, the black curve that you can see in almost a decade can be fully carbonated uh, when it's used as, a, uh, as an external wall or partition in a building. And it shows to, uh, the, the fastest rate of uh, carbon uptake and we can easily achieve the full carbonation for CMU blocks as opposed to uh, other concrete elements such as slabs and beams. But let's zoom in a little bit and see what's going on within this uh, slab calculation. Here, I can show you this figure. Um, on the y-axis, you can see the depth of carbonation. The left y-axis shows the depth from the top surface of the slab and the right uh, y-axis shows the depth from the bottom of the slabs. The pink region shows the non-carbonated region. It's a uh, 10 centimeter slab. And the gray part is the carbonated region. As you can see, as a function of time, the carbonation rate will increase. Uh, from the top layer, we have almost four centimeter carbonation depth after 60 years. The, but the degree of carbonation, which is uh, highly dependent on this uh, exposure condition would be around 0.4 as opposed to the bottom part of this slab, which is in contact with ground, we have a very small carbonation rate around five millimeters after uh, 60 years with degree of carbonation around 0.85. This implies the importance of considering the details when we are assessing the building level carbon uptake um, uh, for LCA purposes. The other important point is we uh, conducted some permutations of this slab with different types of mix design to see to what extent the results, the uptake results can vary when we change the possible mix designs in different locations in the US. The red curve shows the national average carbon uptake. Um, um, what we have seen that when we consider the South, Central or Pacific Northwest, the results can vary by up to 20%. Uh, when we change the mixed design uh, binder types and composition. So it's very important to consider and adopt the local mixed designs and local practices of the, uh, the construction when we think about the building life cycle. Another comparison uh, that I wanted to show here is the single family residential as opposed to three-story commercial. On the y-axis, you have the kilogram CO2 use phase uptake per square meter floor area. And on the x-axis, again, you can see the uh, life cycle years. Again, you can see the uh, prevalence of carbon uptake in basement walls made of CMU in this study, uh, as opposed to the commercial buildings that we don't have any um, mortar applications or uh, concrete masonry units here. Therefore, we don't have much extensive carbon uptake uh, 
The use phase uptake in the single family is around two tons. The end of life uptake based on our estimation is around 0.2 tons. And the total amount of uh, carbon dioxide that was sequestered by the carbon uptake process is around 35% of the calcination emissions. Note that 79% of the cement used in the single family buildings was for concrete purposes. Rest of them, 21% was assumed for mortar and CMU blocks. As opposed to the three-story commercial buildings that almost all the cements used for uh, in, in this building was for concrete uh, production uh, or casting place purposes. And the amount of sequestration, calcination sequestration percentage is around 15% of the uh, the cement GHG emission calcination process. Um, just to note uh, that the calcination emission uh, is a part of the cement GHG emissions that is associated with the chemical reaction and the release of CO2 as a result of the calcination of the calcium carbonate in the mixture. The other major part of the emissions associated with the uh, cement production is the fuel combustion emissions that we excluded from this study because we see that uh, calcination emission is a more uh, consistent um, metric for assessing uh, how much carbon uptake is uh, efficient in terms of the neutralization of the GHG emissions. Now moving on to the lessons that we learned from the sectoral level assessments of the carbon uptake. First, we found that the average, um, the current uh, average amount of carbon uptake is around 14% of the uh, cement calcination emission for the whole cement sector. We see that this value can vary historically from 10 to 18% in the last 20 years. I will show you the graph to, to, um, and the reasoning behind that. We also uh, observed that the cement consumption trend and ratio of mortar versus concrete in different locations could uh, vary the fracture of the carbon uptake in different regions. And also uh, we identified several opportunities for uh, engineering the carbon uptake uh, to be able to uh, accelerate or intensify the carbon uptake by concrete stakeholders and policymakers. To give you an overview of our framework for sectoral level uptake, uh, obviously we consider the whole nation and the whole country as the case study. We went through the understanding of the local construction methods for buildings, pavements, tunnels, and the statistics relevant to amount of cement consumption. The historical cement consumption from 1940 uh, for these sectors were collected. And we built different types of archetypes based on the prevalent method of construction for different types of uh, buildings, uh, again, pavements and pipelines, uh, wastewater treatment uh, facilities, railways, et cetera. Then we calculated the individual carbon uptake uh, element level, and then we sum up the results based on the regional and nationwide aggregations. Here is the uh, US-wide results. On the left y-axis, we can see the amount of carbon uptake in terms of million tons CO2. Uh, on the right wide axis, you can see the calcination emission fraction that was sequestered by the carbon uptake within that given year. And on the x-axis, you can see the year in our analysis period starting from 1940 to 2022. With, with different colors, we can see the uh, amount of carbon uptake sequestered by different phases and also different end use applications. The blue and yellow highlighted colors represents the use phase emissions associated with buildings and other infrastructure systems. But uh, the green ones show the end of life carbon sequestration by the demolished concrete. And the gray part is the cement kiln dust uh, carbon sequestration that will decline um, significantly in the uh, last 10 years of our analysis review, obviously because of the efficiency of the cement plants in using cement kiln dust for, uh, you know, as a, as a circular economy strategy and uh, fully recycling that in the system. Also, we have the, uh, the dots, the black dots here, which is the uptake fraction the corresponding to the right uh, y-axis. And uh, what you can observe, first of all, is that the majority of the carbon uptake during the past few years, uh, more than two thirds of the carbon uptake comes from the use phase uh, or in use uptake of the buildings and uh, other infrastructure systems. 
We see the other one third majorly comes from the, uh, the end of life uh, for different uh, build types of buildings and, and pavements more specifically. And we can see the volatility in the amount of optic fraction in, from one year to another. But during the past uh, eight, nine years, we can see that the amount of optic is almost stable. Um, and here uh, I'm referring to the black line and black dots during the past uh, uh, five, 10 years here, which is around 14% of the calcination emissions um, associated with the cement uh, consumption or production uh, for that given year. Let's zoom in a little bit into the building section that we did this uh, analysis. You can see uh, on the top pie chart, the amount of cement usage for all the buildings in the US. So it's the total amount of cement use. You can see that most of them are for uh, either slab foundations or slab for buildings. But we can see when we look at the uptake, there is a very large fraction of the carbon uptake that comes from the uh, CMU blocks, concrete masonry blocks and mortar applications followed by the amount that we would expect from the slab foundations and footings generally because of the lower compressive strength for this type of elements and the uh, significance of these materials in uh, total uh, cement mass use in different types of buildings. Moving on to the regional level results, we can see a very wide variation of the uptake fractions from one state to another in the US. You can see that in northeastern uh, or eastern part, we have darker color, meaning that a larger fraction of the carbon uptake was sequestered. Uh, a larger fraction of the calcination emission was sequestered by the uptake, as opposed to the uh, Midwest or uh, Rocky Mountain areas that we have uh, a lower percentage of the carbon uptake. So, but the, the variation is between 5% to 25% according to these results. But let's uh, better understand what is the uh, reasoning behind this variation. What we observed was two phenomena. First of all, the amount of, uh, uh, well, the market rate and the trend in the uh, market and the cement consumptions in the past few years in these regions and the amount of uptake fraction, we see almost a, a strong correlation between these two factors. That line shows the correlation here, that when we have a more significant increase in the rate of cement consumptions in those regions, for example, for California or Oregon here, we see a very smaller uh, uptake fractions. The reasoning get back to this equation that uptake fraction is as a function of the total uptake divided by the cement emissions. So if we have a larger cement emission, obviously we are going to decrease the total amount of these fractions. And therefore we have a lower fraction of the carbon uptake happens in this region. This implies that when we think about developed countries or that whose markets are very stable, therefore the amount of carbon uptake would be more significant. For example, those regions that have the numbers around zero would be equivalent to those stabilized markets in developed countries, as opposed to developing countries that might be more representative of this uh, state in down here that has lower uptake fractions. The other important factors that we observe is the ratio between uh, mortar and concrete uh, consumptions or production in different regions for uh, building purposes. Again, we also see that when we see a larger mortar fraction used in different states, we observe a larger fraction of concrete uptake. Obviously, mortars will carbonate faster and more extensively uh, and more intensively, obviously, uh, because of their porous structure and lower compressive strength. Getting back to our results around the differences uh, and the sensitivity of the carbon uptake in different regions, we compare uh, the US results against uh, uh, Mexican market and we calculated and applied our model to the Mexican uh, cement consumption market as well, and that we see a significant and interesting result that although the amount of uh, cement production or consumptions in Mexico is almost less than half of what is in the US currently, uh, the amount of carbon uptake in the Mexican industry is uh, around 80%, so the amount of carbon uptake is 80% of the, of the US as of today. 
And the main reason behind that, we identified lower compressive strength concrete use in Mexico. And we observed that there's a very small fraction of the cement that goes to infrastructure systems as opposed to buildings that uh, could, you know, incorporates the majority of cement consumptions, particularly in the recent years. And uh, building with blocks and using mortars for different parts of buildings are much prevalent in Mexico compared to the US construction practices. Therefore, we observe a more significant uh, carbon uptake per unit of cement production in Mexico compared to uh, the US context. So overall, what we observe is that carbon uptake opportunities exist throughout the cement life cycle, uh, starting from cement kiln dust. Obviously, it's very insignificant amount of carbon uptake, almost zero. And we have cement waste, plaster renders, blocks, and structure itself that can be carbonated during the use phase, as well as the end of life when we are reusing, recycling, or landfilling our materials. But let's think about it, what we can do in order to increase the carbon uptake when it's feasible, and let's use it as a strategy to move towards carbon neutrality. So I put together this list, uh, including the um, cement and concrete value chain stakeholders and policymakers, starting from architects, uh, and what are those parameters that are under the control of these entities in order to maximize the amount of uh, carbon uptake where it is feasible and it's not susceptible to corrosion. First of all, for architects, uh, obviously optimizing geometrical design. Uh, one of the discussions that I have with one of the architects was about using waffle floor, uh, waffle ceilings in general uh, to bring a, a little bit of more uh, surface areas and uh, make the concrete elements and uh, ceilings a little bit thinner in order to carbonate more extensively. So this is one thing that architects can help in order to maximize the amount of carbon uptake. From a structural design perspective, uh, when we think about low carbon specification, low carbon concrete specification by designer, we can think about it from an uptake perspective and the structural designers with the parameters under their control, they can, they can think about the design uh, of a concrete mixture that can have a, a more a significant carbon uptake. Thinking about the mixed design composition and the compressive strength grade that we allocate and assign to each uh, structural elements, that's another important factor. For cement and concrete producers, just uh, simply uh, a win-win solution here is avoid over design. Let's uh, omit the over design and take a little bit of uh, responsibility here to at the same time lower the GHG emissions associated with the mixture and the carbon increase the carbon uptake uh, in that mixture. Thinking about a LCA perspective and how the practitioners can contribute to accelerating or intensifying carbon uptake, uh, we can build this momentum around this to account for the use and end of life uptake when we are thinking about the LCA tools and assigning uh, the relevant uh, uh, impacts of carbon uptake and repair materials on carbon uptake uh, when we think about uh, long lasting products such as pavements or different types of buildings. From EPD and uh, uh, PCR perspective, including uptake would definitely make a change to include and think uh, about carbon uptake when we are uh, thinking about the procurement of our uh, mixed design for a specific project. And most importantly, from policy perspective, uh, we don't see any, um, uh, any news around the natural carbon uptake around the concrete. Uh, it's important because of two reasons. First is that it naturally happens and it can be measurable. So it's a great uh, carbon market incentive. So we can allocate some of our subsidies to that. And at the same time, we can think about the consequence and again, co-benefits of low carbon policies. When we think about changing the mixed design composition or um, defining target goals for lowering the carbon of concrete, it definitely uh, affects the amount of carbon uptake in that mixture as well. So understanding the consequences or the co-benefits of our decision when we move towards different low carbon mixtures would be a good solution from policy making perspective. 
So I'm going to finish here with a summary of what we discussed uh, uh, from LCA perspective and uh, including uptake uh, during the use and end of life. We observed that we can do it for different case studies. What we need is the surface area, the understanding of the um, geometry uh, of our elements, the mixed composition, and the, um, the, the, the exposure conditions. We can also see uh, how significant it is and how it can be influenced by uh, these important factors, more diverse concrete, mixed design composition, and geometry. So these are three important factors we need to take into account to have a precise estimation of the carbon uptake at the building or any cement and use application level. We see it's significant. It's bit, uh, we observe that it's between 15 and 35% of the calcination emission. So it can be accounted in LCA calculations to have a better understanding or more comprehensive understanding of the embodied carbon of uh, uh, concrete structures. From the sectoral level perspective, we see uh, we observe uh, around 14% uh, uh, carbon sequestration as a result of the carbon uptake for different end use application of the cement. And based on the market volatility and the difference in the production and consumption in different sectors, we see that this number can historically vary from 10 to 18% in the last 20 years. Two important factors one is the uh, consumption rate in the last few years of our analysis, and second, the ratio of mortar versus concrete can play a major role in this percentage. And we see a lot of opportunities here uh, to improve the carbon uptake wherever we think that it's feasible and it's relevant. Uh, we can use it as an engineered solution to move toward neutralization of the, uh, the cement GHG emissions in general. With that, I would like to thank you for uh, joining this presentation. Um, here is the list of resources that we have uh, on our website. Feel free to go to download. I'm gonna share these slides with you after this webinar and you can click on the links and uh, um, download them or use them. And I'd be happy to take any questions as well. So um, thank you for, uh, for that. We've had some active Q and A going on here, so I'm gonna try to um, group some of the questions together. We had a couple of technical questions at first um, about the degree of carbonation. So uh, that's kind of a jargony term, and the first individual that framed the question does it in a in a way that I think is much easier for other folks to um, to understand. So, how much CO2 uptake is assumed in the as the depth of carbonation per progresses. So in other words, the way it was phrased here is if you had four centimeters of carbonation is the assumption that the concrete takes up 100% of the CO2 that was released in the production of the, um, for that for that depth amount. Like how did we how do we model that um, aspect of it? Okay, so getting back to the principle of modeling the carbon uptake. So one part is the carbonation rate as the K value, which is as a function of the porosity of your system and the exposure condition. Um, the other important factor that was mentioned is the degree of carbonation, which is uh, as a function of the exposure condition. So if we see a more significant, if we see that the concrete is under the water or under uh, the rain, it's uh, highly likely that a larger percentage of the calcium um, uh, rich products uh, as a result of the hydration would be carbonated. But the rate of carbonation for those uh, types of applications and those um, exposure conditions are lower. So we can see a, a little bit of trade off between these two parameters. Uh, and when, uh, when I showed you that uh, four centimeters uh, slab uh, with 40% degree of carbonation, that was because that slab was uh, sheltered from rain and uh, it wasn't exposed as well. That reduces the amount of uh, degree of carbonation significantly. So per unit of calcium existing in that, uh, uh, in that cement, in that hydrated cement, the assumption is that only 40% of those, uh, those calcium uh, products can be carbonated. Yeah, so maybe like another way to say that, Hassam, and you correct me if I'm wrong. So the K, the rate, 
is about the, the depth that happens over time. And then the degree of carbonation is essentially about the completeness of the reaction exactly. in that, at that depth. And just to be very clear to answer this person's, the degree of carbonation is never 100%. And could you maybe just give a, what's, what's the typical range for that, just so that folks have a, have a sense? Um, could be between 30% and the maximum numbers that I observe in the literature is 75%. Okay, so 30 to 75, so not even, not not particularly close to 100, so yeah. thanks. And um, another uh, sort of technical question is, obviously some concrete is covered, right? It may have, if it's a floor, it may have carpet on it. If it's a wall, it may have paint or, or siding attached to it. Um, did you account for that? And if so, like, could you comment on sort of the, the impact of that? Absolutely. Um, uh, well, this is a very prevalent example when uh, we talk about buildings, right? So most of the uh, surfaces in buildings are finished, meaning that we have uh, something like a paint or, um, for example, there is, a, uh, for example, a carpet for floors that definitely reduces the rate of carbonation. So we took them into account when we were assessing uh, the impact of carbon uptake for different types of archetypes. Um, and that's part of the exposure condition um, assumptions. Mm -hmm. And just in having heard you talk about it, th those are things that have been studied and um, their sort of coefficients essentially to, to account for that reduction. Is that right? Exactly, that's true. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take us may, maybe a little different direction, slightly less technical questions, more of an implication question, which is that, it, you know, if you look at your um, national map, uh, you, you can see kind of a couple of states that are much lighter than even the region that they're, they're in. So, you know, one that kind of jumps out at you is like New York, right, which is much lighter than right next door. Uh, you know, any sort of any direction. Mm -hmm. What what might be accounting for that? Oh uh, well, I'm I'm trying to find New York on these. Uh, well, how about just pick a, a? Oh oh, I see you find New York. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here and here it's uh, so it's in the middle of the range, as opposed to Vermont, Maine, that you can see in the upper part. Meaning that uh, from our analysis, we show that around, for example, 20% of the cement in these uh, regions go to uh, mortar applications as opposed to New York, which is uh, perhaps a very lower number. So one um, observation that could explain the lower um, carbon uptake rate for New York would be uh, less prevalent use of uh, CMU concrete masonry blocks uh, compared to other New England states. Oh, and also the, uh, the cement market trend in the last five years or so. Uh, like I said, if the market is in significant decline uh, for the last few years, we, we observe a larger fraction of the carbon uptake. So for New York, it's in the middle, maybe 4% growth in the last five years, which puts New York here in the middle of this, um, as opposed to, for example, Connecticut or uh, Wyoming if, or West, West Virginia, sorry that are in the upper range here. So it's, it may have lower CMU use and it may actually, and if the market is growing faster than the adjacent states, exactly. those are two things that could cause it to, to be lower. Yeah. Um, we had a couple of questions that I'm, I'm gonna kind of group together that have to do with CMUs. So um, some folks on the call may not be aware, but there are, there are technologies that are being um, rolled out in the concrete masonry industry to uh, pre-carbonate uh, blocks, right? To, or to do accelerated carbonation in the production stage. And so one of the questions is, if a concrete block was produced using, using CO2 cured in, I'm gonna assume in the production, will mm -hmm. the in-use carbonation be reduced? Absolutely. So. The idea uh, around these technologies is to mineralize CO2 in the mixture. And the mineralization process, uh, to our understanding, happens uh, as a result of the reaction of the calcium rich product uh, and converting them to calcium hydroxide or uh, 
uh, calcium and aluminum hydro, uh, sorry, calcium um, carbonate and calcium aluminum carbonate as well. Um, here, as we reduce the amount of available uh, calcium in the mixture as a result of the initial carbon uh, cure activities, then we have less amount of uh, calcium available later uh, to be carbonated during the use and end of life phase. Gotcha. Um, again, uh, quite a few questions have rolled in here. So let, let's see if uh, um, one thing I, I'm there, uh, Paul gave a really good comment that we may have misascribed over design in your uh, to the cement and concrete producers, where it's probably more on the uh, architects and uh, uh, contractors point. Just still an important strategy, but maybe it's a different stakeholder that has more influence on it. But um, it, Paul also asked if we could clarify a little bit um, about the cement kiln dust and you know why you know it's it's very noticeable in the slide that its impact drops off considerably in the later years. Um, if you could maybe just share as to why that seems to be the case. Sure. Historically, we realized that all the number that I have on top of my head is. Uh, we have 6% sediment kiln dust generation as a result of, uh, uh, you know, kiln kill production uh, from the US EPA data. But we see that uh, the amount of sediment kiln dust available, well, that is sent to landfilling is almost uh, close to zero uh, based on the most recent statistics. So the unavailability of uh, sediment kiln dust in the recent years uh, causes that significant decline in the amount of uh, carbon uptakes uh, associated with the uh, with this uh, part of the production process and byproducts. Yeah, the industry has gotten better about making productive use of it so that it doesn't end up being kind of uh, distributed, right? Um, right? The other part of that question was um, any sense as to why the fraction doesn't seem to sort of stay constant in the historic period, where, where as opposed to kind of growing to kind of a considerable state there before declining. Okay, so there are three uh, competing parameters here. One is the total amount of kiln care production in a year. So you can see that it varies significantly from one year to another. That would cause a variation of the amount of cement kiln dust generation from one year to another. The second parameter is the, the percentage of the cement kiln dust as a result of the kiln efficiency. Again, like I said, it's in the significant decline uh, and it's almost close to zero. And the third parameter here is the fraction of those cement kiln dust that have been historically recycled into cement uh, for, uh, for cement, important cement production, as opposed to the fraction that is available for landfilling. So when we think all, uh, about all these three parameters, we can see all this variation uh, about the cement kiln dust uptake from one year to another. Excellent. Um, I, I'm going to pre-apologize because I know we're not going to get through everybody's question here. Does concrete strength directly impact um, the results here, the capacity for uptake or the rate? Sure. Uh, the proxy for assessing the diffusivity, in other words, the porosity of the concrete in the EN standard is considered as compressive strength. So the higher the compressive strength, the lower the porosity, so the lower the carbonation rate. And this uh, uh, compressive strength uh, definitely affects the rate of carbonation uh, for different types of elements. Most noticeably, uh, if I want to show you the difference, is the difference between uh, the single family residential that have usually comprised lower compressive strength compared to the commercial buildings that needs to be more efficient in terms of the space, therefore a higher compressive strength. You can see that both of them have uh, slab uh, carbonation, but the carbonation, the carbon uptake of slab in single family is larger than the uh, amount, uh, the equivalent amount in the commercial buildings per square meter floor area. So one of the uh, explanations for this difference is the difference in the compressive strength assumption for slabs in these two case studies. Excellent. Um, I'm gonna maybe ask you one or two more technical ones and then I wanna save some time because there's kind of some bigger picture questions. Um, 
that are that are in here we had a question of you know um like on slide 19 one of your suggestions kind of implied the opposite of this wouldn't wouldn't carbon uptake be increased with higher cement contents you know um so what we observed here uh, when we think about the over cementing perspective the third uh, um, suggestion that i see uh, here and from our analysis it shows that over cementing the mixture um, usually ended up with a higher compressive strength in the in the mixture as well and that higher compressive strength is consequently affecting negatively on the carbon uptake rate so when I uh, mentioned over design and over cementing for uh, cement and concrete producers role, I meant that by reasonably designing the mixtures and delivering uh, based on the, uh, you know, the minimum requirements of the construction code for over design. So the prescribed over design, you would be able to optimize the carbon uptake and at the same time save some uh, carbon footprint from the concrete production as well. So that's why I call it win-win solution. So mm -hmm. over cementing obviously provides a larger amount of calcium in the mixture, but the prevalent mechanism here is the increase in the compressive strength and significantly lowering down the carbon uptake rate. Mm -hmm. And sort of a related question there is, does the use of fly ash or slag reduce uptake? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, when we think about low carbon concrete, the first uh, solution that comes to uh, most of people's mind is about using a more extensive amount of SCMs, including fly ash or cementitious materials uh, such as a slag. Um, the amount of calcium available in this slag and fly ash are lower than Portland cement. So we have less calcium available, therefore less uh, maximum theoretical carbon uptake, so-called. But at the same time, the rate of carbon uptake in the SCM incorporated mixture is uh, two, three times, a few times, I, I would say a few times larger than uh, a plain Portland cement mixture. So the, extensi the extent of carbon uptake in uh, fly ash and slag incorporated mixtures are larger, but the intensity, in other words, the DOC parameter that we discussed uh, and the maximum theoretical uptake uh, based on the amount of um, the available calcium is lower. So uh, it's, a, it's a kind of decision between and the competing mechanism between the uh, higher carbonation rate as opposed to lower calcium available for, um, uh, for, uh, for carbonation. But in general, when we think about the future low carbon concrete, perhaps uh, carbonation remains an important and interesting question to answer. Uh, that what if we change all these and what's going to happen for carbon uptake? Do we accelerate it? Do we increase it? Or do we have any issues with, uh, uh, you know, carbon uptake in general? Right. Um, I'm going to pose a question to you. And then while you think about the answer, I'll, I'll, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping things. So one of the questions came in, which is how does this 14% that you have found differ from the more common, this very commonly cited um, 43 percent from the G paper in 2016. Um, and so while you're while you think about the answer to that, just a couple just to knock out some of the housekeeping questions that have been answered, we will distribute the recording for this and um, I should check with Andrew about whether the slides will all, or probably a PDF of the slides will also be distributed. And um, the uh, someone asked about publication, there are a few of um, briefs that have been available on this, and we're very close to having a preprint of this publication posted. And so we'll distribute a link to that to everyone that's registered as soon as that's available. So um, 14 versus 43 percent. So. Well, that's another interesting question. We well, once we finish the, our first round of analysis, uh, we pose the same questions from ourselves. That well, it's natural part of the research, right? You want to validate the results, or you want to compare your results with the literature to better understand how you you your results are different from the others. And one of these results that have uh, you know similar time frame because they have historically uh, you, know, you know estimated the carbon uptake. Uh, was this paper that was published in 2016. 
Uh, we observed a few differences in the input parameters and assumptions in those papers as opposed to ours. Uh, first of all, the scope was different. So they have global scope and uh, our scope was only uh, for United States. So if you dig into the United States part, perhaps, perhaps you see less difference here. The other important difference was the uh, mortar carbon uptake accounting in their analysis and our analysis. So it was another point of variation. Uh, briefly speaking, <clears throat> Uh, the composition of mortars and the fraction of mortars that we assumed was quite different from their assumptions. So they considered a larger fraction of cement that goes into mortar applications as opposed to our uh, work. The other important and influential factors that we observe is that not only a small fraction of the concrete at the end of life will be carbonated because of the availability and the accessibility to the atmosphere. Um, in our previous uh, publications and webinars, we discussed about the geometry of the state uh, stockpile, as opposed to the other paper that was that assumed that the whole stockpile or the whole end of life uptake will be carbonated really rapidly. So that causes a very major difference between our results and their results. Now, the degree of carbonation uh, was another influential factor. Our observation was that the degree of carbonation would barely exceed 75% uh, in most extreme cases. Um, we observed that in those studies, sometimes uh, for the end of life, it was assumed around 100%. And in another case for mortar application, it was around 80%. So that causes uh, a bit of discrepancy between the results when you assume uh, you know, different parameters. And uh, by no means I'm criticizing those papers, but I'm saying that we think that our parameters and our uh, specifically archetypes that we assume for the US is more representative of the reality and the historical uh, practices in the region. Um, now we have sort of, I'm gonna give you a few kind of bigger picture questions. Um, what, how do you envision this? hubs framework being used by policymakers, research researchers, like different stakeholders in the construction sector? Where, where do you uh, see this work fitting in? Uh, our strategy around the carbon uptake research uh, is at different levels of engagements. So we provide information like this kind of analysis that I just showed you to policymakers so they could use it to better envision the future and the importance of carbon uptake and considering concrete as a carbon sink and how they can incentivize the market, like I said, for uh, taking into account the carbon uh, um, sequestration by uh, concrete during the use and end of life for different programs. And the other part is uh, the engagement at the uh, empowerment level. We are hoping to enable the practitioners, designers, like structural and architectural designers to get involved and uh, to be able to calculate their own um, uh, analysis based on the case studies that they are facing. For that, we have developed this uh, very simple uh, Excel-based tool that everyone can download from our website and use it. And if you have any uh, specific parameters, uh, it's open access, you can, uh, an open source, you can uh, just uh, adjust the, the numbers and run your analysis based on that. So I would say different strategies for different stakeholders uh, to get them engaged uh, with this research and uh, leverage the opportunity uh, for these inherent properties of concrete. Great. And I'm going to ask you one last question and probably need to keep it a little bit brief, but wh where do you see the gaps in this research field right now? Is the, wh where do you need more work? Is it about understanding uh, carbonation rate coefficients, degree of carbonation in different contexts, where, where, where would it be best to uh, see more work here? Uh, personally, if you broaden the question to the whole analysis of um, environmental impacts associated with the cement-based products, um, I would say carbonation is one of the most well-studied ones because of the long history of the uh, experimental and numerical modeling around carbon uptake. So uncertainty from a life cycle perspective, uncertainty in carbon uptake, I think is lower than the other uh, parts of life cycle calculations. But if you want to only focus on this and improve the, the carbon uptake modeling, uh, again, from a systems perspective, uh, 
I think it's very, uh, uh, you know, uh, preferred if we could um, develop uh, site-specific models, particularly from an end-of-life perspective, uh, to have a better representative input data uh, for modeling the end-of-life carbon uptake. So I would prioritize end-of-life carbon uptake as the use uh, phase uptake is very well studied and understood by um, materials engineers and um, perhaps uh, systems practitioners. Um, excellent. Well, I don't think that we have time for any more questions, um, but what I, we're going to try to do is, I know there's about half a dozen questions that we didn't get to, so uh, Hassam and myself and Andrew will try to put together some answers and email those out to, to folks. Um, Thank you again, Hassan, and thank you to everyone that joined us. Uh, like I, like Andrew mentioned at the beginning, once we uh, do a little bit of processing on it, we will distribute a link to the recording and look forward to you joining us for future webinars. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone.